welcome. Here we are at our little uh, kind of, what would you call it? A hobby farm, a homestead of the Wilhelmsen family. This is my oldest son, Jeremiah. And let me give you a little bit of a tour. So this is the house we live in. Okay, it seems like there's something going on here. My <laughs> second oldest son, Simeon, seems to be playing with the kittens. This way is where our birds are. So we have uh, chickens and uh, ducks. In the daytime, in the summer, they roam around here in our yard. In the evenings, they go here or for the night. Thankfully, I don't even have to chase them in, at least not most of the time. They go on their own there. There might be some uh, chicken eggs or duck eggs. So yes, there's some over here. There's some there, okay. Uh, we have but about 15 or under 15 chickens we have, but only three of them uh, are egg-laying um, chickens. The chickens like to hide the eggs somewhere in the yard which we don't really like because we don't find them very easily, but thankfully they put them here now. Hey, bye-bye. Then we have nine ducks at the moment, and at least one of the ducks uh, gives us eggs. We moved to this farm half a year ago. We are not doing farming uh, full-time, or no, by no stretch, and we are not in any way fully self-sufficient or anything. Uh, it's more of a, you could say, it's our family hobby, uh, and uh, and so this this is not my job. I don't get paid for this, and I have full time uh, job as as a pastor, and and uh, Allison with the boys at home and homeschooling and all that. I grew up uh, in Watford, which is near London in the UK, and we did have a big garden, and my dad gardened a lot. And I wish now, in retrospect, I'd pay a little bit more attention to. Um, him and learning to grow because it would be useful now um, but I was a city girl yeah countryside living and farm life is yeah new, uh, new to us uh, new both to daddy. Daddy, I'm so we have three sheep oh let's see uh, we've had them for uh, from the beginning of this summer so we're kind of new with the sheep. Uh, and the oldest one is Maya here, this gray one. She's, uh, I think, about two and a half years old. And uh, Maya is the mother of this black one. Oh, oh dear. You okay? Did he hurt? What? So this is Maya. Uh, the oldest one of these sheep, she's about two and a half years old. And this is Piki, which is Maya's daughter, and she's, I think, uh, j just over one year old. She's very kind of shy. Then we have the little one, Leela. Leela, tutten. Yeah, I think she's a bit scared. We're all here now. Oh, well. Yeah, I think there's many benefits for. <laughs> this this kind of living it it gives a kind of a more of a, a place where you can as a family grow and enjoy and learn and then also uh, definitely teaches you many things um, i think it should make you realize to be more thankful um, even the fact okay where does your food come from it you know someone had to grow it someone had to butcher it someone had to do the things that so it ended up in the shop and and even though we kind of know all those things i think in actual daily life then people just well you just go to the shop and you get that stuff and you don't think about that aspect of living ever since i was a child i've just seen lived in rental apartments and lived in so many different places kind of this not being rooted anywhere and just continually moving and not feeling that any place is really your place. Mm. So then when you then kind of buy your own, like I own this, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm responsible for this and my plan, you know, our plan now is to live and die here, you know, God willing, <laughs> that, that that's our uh, uh, plan. So then it's suddenly you're like, okay, this is it. And you start taking paying attention to things and taking care of it. I like the idea, especially of my kids, like thinking, okay, no, we've grown up here and having 
more rooted here and getting to know the wider community. and It becomes more concrete that, yeah, maybe I should know the neighbors, as opposed to when I'm in a rental apartment in a big flat, like, you know, the neighbors don't want to know me. I might not want to bother knowing them in general. You know, you just kind of pass, hey, my, you know, and then who knows, next month they might not even live there anymore. No, for example, our neighbor, it's been 300 years in their family, the other neighbor there, and uh, that's kind of an extreme, but still... Uh, you know, people have roots, people care about the community and, and um, yeah, it's, it's just refreshing and good. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good aspect of just owning uh, something uh, that, that is yours and, and you start suddenly treating it a little bit differently. The sheep eat the grass here and there are all the plants except the nettles they don't like, they leave that, but pretty much everything else they eat. And so I then move them uh, usually about once a week or sometimes maybe more often uh, and move them with this, this is a movable electric fence and so then they can have fresh grass. So. And yeah, I remember the first week we had them and I was really proud. They followed me around and I was walking here on the property. They just followed me without anything. I'm like, look at me, I'm the shepherd. They're like following me, they're respecting me. And it was great. Until then, was it that same day in the evening, suddenly these sheep decided to walk straight on the road. And it's quite a busy road there near. And they're on the road, <laughs> and I'm chasing these sheep on the road. They're like, what? You know? And then my neighbor, he came to help me, and finally we got them back. So that was a very vivid example of, okay, yeah, you know, the Bible calls uh, uh, us as humans and as believers that uh, uh, we are the sheep, the flock of God, and, you know, he cares for us, he takes care of us, and, and we can be very stubborn and foolish, yet and he, he takes us back for our own good. We don't always realize what's for our own good, like the sheep on the road about to get hit by a big truck. Uh, I'll put her uh, here attached to the tree for that time. I like to put uh, the leader of the group, Maya, on a leash so that she doesn't get too excited and, and run away. The other ones uh, uh, like to just stay nearby and uh, stay near Maya. So. Seems like the ducks went in the pond now. That's cool. Now that we've got the actual fence, fence moved, we need to also move this, I don't know what it's called, I guess the, in Finnish it's called Sähköpaimen, electric shepherd. <laughs> Part of that is then putting this deep into the ground. And I don't really understand much about electricity, but somehow this gives the uh, what is it, Madotus in Finnish, grounding. Yeah, the other ones thankfully follow. Yeah. Oh, now it came off this one again. And now that I plug it in here, it should work. Let's see. Yeah, and I can hear there's this little tick, tick sound. But I usually try it also. But yeah, it gives a little bit of... first animal we got when we were still living in the row house was rabbits, so meat rabbits. So start with one and then learning that, learning the process. And in this place where we now live, this used to be a kind of a commercial uh, farm like 30 years ago. It's quite a big piece of land and there's big buildings. And so there's a lot to do, but since we're not doing it full time by any stretch, and we, we're not in that sense of a hurry. We do it as we have uh, time. And as a kind of daily chores, I think it's only, I would say, 
about half an hour per day to the maintaining of the animals we have, which I think for most people is kind of like surprisingly little. Most people spend more than half an hour walking their dog uh, in a day and we have quite a few animals. Obviously then when things go wrong, it might take longer or if you have to do build something or get new animals, it takes longer. But the, just the basic maintenance doesn't take that much per day. It's more about spending time often as a family together. Um, the extra work for me maybe comes in learning how to cook new things and how to be creative. Um, as I said, like learning to cook and eat the rabbits. It's been a process over a while and now I feel like I've got the best method. And this summer really was learning the land and what it was like mm. and experimenting with different things and you know so I guess the work could be as little as half an hour a day doing the animals to as much time as I have free to do mm. plenty of other things around. The thing that really like motivates me and that I've kind of grown in in understanding it's not so much like some people think okay you're homesteading and you're on a farm like this kind of like uh, you think the world is going to end, you know, you have your own food, like this food security, or then that you have like more healthy food. I think the food security and the healthy food, those are nice things and I appreciate them and they're like really nice bonuses. Uh, but I would say that the thing that's there driving behind all of this is kind of the understanding uh, that God has created the world, he's created humans and how humans have been created to live in this world and just like there's all these plants that uh, that God has created, there's all these animals, there's this earth and how that then relates to even the book of Genesis and be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and have dominion uh, over all the animals. So, so kind of what you could maybe call like um, creational living the most important part of actually like doing getting your hands dirty learning having animals doing together as a family that's the thing that's driving uh, behind there and those other things are nice bonuses rabbits keep on multiplying like rabbits. So we have quite a few of them. Uh, Jeremiah, careful with them. Yeah. Uh, so we move this so they get to eat. Basically, they're doing the same thing as the, the sheep, the sheep graze there. Uh, with rabbits, it's a little bit different. But um, yeah, they eat the grass and they like it. So Jeremiah, could you move a little bit? We'll move this cage. You can go to the side now. Well, okay, but be careful. Okay, let's move. This white big one is the daddy rabbit. And here's the two mommy rabbits. And actually about a week ago, we got uh, another two rabbits born. Sometimes it can even be 14 baby rabbits, but the normal is more like, you know, eight or something like that. But this time it was only two, two that were born, but they are quite chubby already. I guess they're getting a lot of milk from their mommy since there's only two of them. So this one is just over a week old. And uh, I think yesterday was the first time I saw its eyes open. So uh, it's, it's just opened its eyes to the world. I think the, the other one, I think might still have his eyes closed even. Let's see. Yeah. Well, maybe just a little, no. Oh yeah, one of them is open. The other one is a little bit closed still. So this one is actually our first, first rabbit that we got. His the, eyes are open. Yeah, his eyes are open. This is Rusko. So Rusko is the mommy rabbit of all, all the other ones. I've got four young boys and it's fun to teach them where food comes from, how it's grown, um, you know, so with the kids, what they did the planting of the seeds and I've got them involved in 
watering them and looking after them and you know so in that respect it's been a fun learning thing and I think as they get older I'd like to see them do more of their own growing of stuff as well and the first bunnies that we had were definitely the hardest like because the first baby bunnies we had they had named them and um, you know it was sad for them and it was like they had played with them and everything like that so that was definitely the hardest but we had prepared them in advance they always knew that like the mummy and the daddy rabbits they were staying but the baby rabbits would end up as food if I, we buy meat from the shop they don't know what kind of life they lived or anything like that now they kind of got used to having baby bunnies and they have you know so they play with them but maybe not as much as when they first had them so you know it it doesn't phase them anymore We had some cucumbers, there's still a few. Jeremiah planted them and Daddy, Simeon. there's one big cucumber. Oh yeah, there's one big it's cucumber. It's all, all the way to the floor. Okay, and who planted the tomatoes? Me. And uh, we got some ripe ones, it seems. I think we even planted a few different varieties. And by the way, the greenhouse is here. About 30 years ago, this property was used as like a commercial greenhouse business. Uh, so it's kind of run down, but it's still works the basic structure and at some point I think like 15 years ago or so someone planted a uh, grape a vine in Finland it's quite rare to have grapes growing uh, it's not warm enough uh, and long enough summers to have um, have grapes grow very well outdoors people do grow them but they usually yeah they become very small these are small as well, but they're still big enough to eat and nice and juicy. They have the seeds inside, like you know, plants should have, fruit should have. And uh, they are very tasty. The seeds maybe have a little bit of bitterness, but apparently the seeds are very healthy from what I read. Even more nutritious than the fruit itself. You want to show your cucumbers? Okay, yeah. I hear some little ones still growing. Oh, oh, that's a big one. Oh yeah, I haven't seen that one. That's cool. Let's hey, let's let's lift it up to show here. Wow, look at that. <laughs> that's a nice one. I didn't realize that that was growing. Okay, you want to cut it? Oh, I'm gonna just cut a leaf off. Okay, that's good. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. Big one. Okay. One of the biggest we've got. Yeah, one of, yeah, I think that is. Hopefully it tastes good also. Five years from now, if Miska gets his way, <laughs> let's say we have a cow, because that's next on his uh, agenda, and I'm not so sure about that one, but you know, we will <laughs> see. I, I was not sure about all the other animals, I think, um, you know, Maybe a few more animals, I don't know, goats. It depends, you know, what we can. More sheep. Uh, more sheep, yeah. And I think the five years from now, like I'd like to have more plants growing. Like we have the huge greenhouse and this year, you know, we're not utilizing it at all to its full potentials. We're pretty much so that, you know, we can eat, uh, you know, eat a rabbit every week mm. with the production we have going. Uh, and, um, then when we're planning to have then duck meat more. So with the meat production, we're not even that far from essentially needing no meat from the, from the shop. But yeah, it would be nice to be able to do most of those basic things, most of the things we eat and use, it would be nice to be able to produce ourselves. And I don't think it's, it's not too, you know, uh, far-fetched or unrealistic. OK, 
Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us, giving us a beautiful sunny day. And uh, thank you for providing us with food to eat and time we have together. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 But these are really special to mothers that have a little bit of food in them. Because remember, we grew all different kinds of tomatoes, and if I had remembered properly, we would have known which one they were. If you're gonna do this, you just have to be crazy enough <laughs> to do it. You know, you you need to have enough curiosity and courage to do it. Because I guess the difference between someone who thinks, you know, that would be cool, maybe I'd like to, but never does it, and then someone says that would be cool, I'll give it a go, even if I fail. And I'm that latter person, and Misk is that former person, so that's why we end up doing all these yeah. crazy things. But it's good, because it has been and is a great experience. And then I think one other thing that helps us learn is trial and error. Mm. Like, you know, we had, actually we had quails two summers ago, mm. one summer ago, and just realized that they were really small, fiddly birds and produced tiny eggs and it just wasn't... It's not just it's for just us. Not, it just not isn't now, for us. Yeah. And now we have more land and we've got the chickens and the ducks, ducks and yeah. they are um, better. And, you know, I think every animal that we've had has escaped at least once, but we got them back. You can read all the books in the world, you can watch all the YouTube videos, but until you actually have the animal and mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> learn then, you know, each ind animal is even individual and learn with the animal. My word of advice for anyone kind of thinking or uh, about this kind of living, I think first of all, to have it re really clear in your mind why you would want to do this and what's your kind of uh, driving force behind there. Because you have to make compromises. You can't get your dream place and everything what you might, uh, unless you're just very rich. It's, it's gonna require uh, sacrifice, it's gonna require learning, it's gonna be difficulty. Uh, whatever your current living situation is, even if you're in an apartment or a row house, whatever, start something. I think that's the key also when you think like self-sufficiency and this living. Start doing something with your own hands, even like baking more, you know, planting something, have even a few plants to get a little bit of a taste of if you've never done those things before, to do them. And then, hey, I, I was able to do this, maybe I could do more. Yeah, and just be willing to trial and also know that you're likely to fail. Mm. Like, you know, I've grown stuff and it's not at all worked out. Um, but and be happy to try again. There's a lot of things that you don't actually need need that you can live without so kind of being willing to then yeah try it out and okay we might get this house it might not have running water but if we re if we really want land if we really want this maybe we can live without running water <laughs> <laughs>